Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this very, very um, long-awaited conversation between Madhu and Shorya this evening. Against the backdrop of Shorya's ongoing uh, exhibition, "There Is No God in the Temple," you see the centerpiece behind me. Uh, I'll begin by introducing uh, Shorya Kumar and Madhuvanti Ghosh, and then they will take over the conversation from there. Uh, Shorya studied at the Delhi College of Art. He graduated with an MFA from the University of Tennessee and moved to Chicago 10 years ago. He was involved in the research for 26 documentary films on the painting traditions of India, as well and on uh, Handmade in India, an encyclopedia on the handicraft traditions of India. He also helped in the research for the digital restorations of the 6th century Buddhist mural paintings of Ajanta. Shorya has exhibited all over the US, including the Queen's Museum and several other countries, the Seoul Museum at the Sundaram Tagore uh, Gallery. He also did a solo exhibition at the Bhav Daji Lard Museum in 2015. This is Shorya's first exhibition in New Delhi. He is professor of printmaking at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and also chair of faculty and director of diversity, equity, and inclusion. This exhibition comes from extensive research and scholarship. He uses a variety of mediums and diverse tools to articulate his ideas. Shorya lives in Chicago with his two adorable children, Nayantara and Kabir. I'm sorry, I couldn't resist mentioning them, Shorya. <laughs> We have with us also Dr. Madhuvanti Ghosh, who is the inaugural Alstoff Associate Curator of Indian Southeast Asian and Himalayan Art at the Art Institute of Chicago, where she is responsible for the exhibition, collection, preservation, and research of the museum's permanent collection in these areas. Since joining the museum in 2007, she has curated and organized a series of exhibitions on various aspects of Indian art. She led the Vivekanand Memorial Program for Museum Excellence designed to foster professional exchanges between the Art Institute and various museums in India. In 2020 and 21, she organized virtual workshops on museum curation for the American Institute of Indian Studies, supported by the US Mission to India. Madhu has served until recently on the board of trustees of the American Association of Art Museum Curators and is the recipient of the Center for Curatorial Leadership and Fellowship class of 2020. Thank you so much, Madhu, for making time today. We all know how busy you are and how you managed to dovetail so many things to fit this conversation in. But I guess because your connection with Shorya has been so long outstanding, the understanding of his practice only you could have, you know, got, got things out of him. This conversation is going to be very revealing in many ways. So I will hand over the floor to you now. Thank you, uh, Tunti. It's a pleasure. Um, I, I just <laughs> could not say no to both you and to Sharia. Uh, usually I don't do these uh, conversations with artists, but uh, on this occasion, um, I just had to make an exception. Um, as you noted, um, Shorya Kumar is, uh, uh, has been, uh, since he joined the School of the Art Institute, a dear colleague. Um, and in a way, our respective careers um, at the School of the Art Institute and at the Art Institute have kind of mirrored each other and kind of run parallelly. So it gives me great pleasure to um, uh, be in conversation with Shorya about uh, this body of work uh, of his. Um, as you can see, uh, the exhibition is titled There is No God in the Temple. Um, and uh, I hope all of you will uh, get to see as we um, get further into the conversation that there are many themes in this exhibition that resonate for a curator like myself. Uh, with my background and the kind of work that I do as a curator and as someone who um, uh, is responsible in the kind of old-fashioned 
uh, terminology of curators, you know, as a keeper of collections. Um, there are many themes that um, Shorya brings up in this body of work that uh, resonate, mean a lot to uh, someone like me. And I hope that in this conversation today, we're able to kind of uh, delve into some of those bigger issues that he is um, sometimes talking hauntingly about uh, through his works and sometimes much more um, um, directly, shall we say. So um, thank you for making the time for, uh, to join all of us um, this morning, as I shall say, from Chicago, um, since it's bright and early um, uh, on a Saturday morning in Chicago. Um, Shorya, uh, let's uh, start this conversation by delving a little bit about um, you and your journey to Chicago. Um, uh, perhaps you can share with our audience um, the trajectory of your life from art school back in Delhi uh, to art school in America and, and, and then actually to uh, becoming professor of print media at um, SAIC. How has that journey kind of evolved for you from, the, from your practice point of view, from your, um, uh, you know, the way you think about your work? And perhaps you can share some of that work with us as well. Sure. Uh, thank you so much, Madhu. Uh, I think first I would like to again thank all of you. As Madhu said, it's a it's a gray morning on Saturday in Chicago. And, and for those in the U.S., I hope it's better than what it is here. So thank you for joining in. And of course, uh, for everybody in India and, and elsewhere as well. Uh, I would, of course, begin by saying thank you for Tunti and for the team at Threshold for inviting me to install this exhibition. Uh, which is up till February 15th, I believe. Um, uh, you know, it during uh, the the pandemic, of course, it got rescheduled a couple of times, but it gave me some extra opportunities to continuously work and challenge myself to address this idea, which I feel is quite complex, and hopefully we can unravel some of that also. Uh, and Madhu, of course, thank you so much for agreeing to do this uh, and for this very kind introduction. I know that we have worked together on numerous things over the past few years. This is our first formal, I believe, engagement uh, uh, on a on a program. So I really appreciate that as well, and 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 looking forward to our in-depth discussion about the work. Uh, I I would say that uh, you know I was very fortunate and had a great honor to work with some of the most incredible and talented artists and teachers while I was at College of Art. Um, unlike namely Anupam Sood and Kanchan Chandra in particular, who I who I worked very extensively with. And outside of the school with Mr. Emma Ranjan, who taught me nearly everything that I know and prepared me to be, to be where I am today as an artist and as an academic. Um, my work, I feel, also owe a lot to the origins in Delhi itself, right? I spent the first 24 years of my life and, of course, keep a very intimate relationship with Delhi, visiting uh, multiple times a year, if not at least every year. Um, and sort of just understanding the the history of the city the complexity the way sort of it has simultaneously histories and narratives and identities coexisting at the same time have sort of always been very influential not maybe directly in the visuality of the work but at least the way i process right uh okay. process understanding us and ourselves for example mm -hmm. uh, I've, i i'm reminded of uh, a conversation that happened in 1991 between Salman Rushdie and Bollinger at Columbia, where Rushdie had said, you know, and I'm, I'll quote him here, is that no matter how great the storm, yeah, if that plunges me into the contradiction and paradox, so be it. I've lived in that messy ocean all my life. I fish in it for my art. And I feel that sort of, you know, even with my move to the US, first for the postgraduate studies and then working professionally, the complexity of Delhi is a can continue to exp uh, inspire me. Uh, the idea of sort of, you know, th this understanding of an impact of a storm, whether it be in an external weather phenomena or a sociological or a political or cultural paradoxes and how it impacts us appeared very early in my works as well, right from the beginning as I was, you know, studying um, in Delhi. Mm -hmm. uh, 
the tactical the tactile experiences of just living and navigating the complexity of delhi the overcrowded dtc buses where we would hang out of the open doors and you know with portfolio in one hand hoping not to fall off the buses uh made me sort of think about approaching the work in a way that the material engagement was sometimes very romanticized and very direct as well so while i was working you know on paintings and prints simultaneously i was thinking about the very nature of a material in itself so for example in some of these works i was using etching in not in a traditional manner of in a manner of way drafting the drawings to hard grounds and whatever but i would exploit the properties of corrosion and embossment in a metaphorical level but also sometimes in a very physical and a literal level as well i remember when i you know in my first few years of being in chicago uh, when uh, madhu we had hosted zarina's exhibition paper like skin that mm-hmm. that idea of paper being very akin to the skin it ages and wrinkles and cracks the same way and the fact that indian atmosphere is not conducive to paper in itself that paradox itself was somewhat sort of very relevant to the work although it's not always obvious when you're making it i think sometimes right. in reflection uh mm-hmm. was very much part of that um as tunti had mentioned right my my working with with binoy behel on the projects of uh, the paintings of india project and handmade mm-hmm. simultaneously gave me a great understanding of the rich history and traditions of india um all these i still carry with me as i work and live in chicago um like while on the surface as you would see that the works visuality and aesthetic and material might look and appear very different on the surface but mm-hmm. i feel that there's a very sort of continuous thread that binds the work together that that i've always sort of gone back to um it is rooted i feel in you know the in the investigations of the mysteries of the city itself where i came from um you know and sometimes we feel very familiar but at the same time it's the familiarity that makes us marginalize those those aspects the most as well um i also uh for example you know from from my research and scholarship and 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 teaching in academia think a lot about for example uh the ideas of objects themselves the objects the value of the objects the position of the objects the power of the objects and i'm reminded of of bodria's uh statement when he said that we always live off the splendor of an o- of of the subject and the poverty of an object right to see how they circulate and how we often look through these objects you mm-hmm. know and the, how the objects disclose our history our society and the nature or culture but most importantly how we understand ourselves through objects is something that i've always been very interested in um uh we you know as the objects sort of move in from different context um we think of them as confronting the thingness right sort of they suddenly transform from a non object phenomena a living object phenomena to something that is converted immediately into material right when it sort of flows through the circuits of production and distribution consumption and exhibition and how they get arrested in that particular narrative Mm-hmm. and these these stories of objects is something that i i feel i have always investigated this particular object subject relationship is something i feel that drives my work very strongly but sure there's a big uh, transition if you like from uh, even though those early works of yours um in in the exploration of the materials uh, yeah. there is a, a you know a, a turn towards the object but there was a certain flatness a certain t- 2dness of about them yeah. and um, this transition to the object to the 3dness of the object which is so apparent in your current body of work how yeah. do you feel that that transition has happened i mean i understand your interest in some of these themes and subjects but yeah. uh, now that you are in a position to kind of look back at your trajectory um yeah. do you see a kind of transforming moment I, was I that do. happening in art school in america already or do you feel that it's it's happened more kind of in your role at the uh, saic uh yeah. you know the kind of parallel like the body of work i've been doing uh, curating the the atmosphere that you're surrounded by yeah 
No, I think that's a very good question. And I feel in my practice, my approach has always been to be collaborative with the media rather than to, to, to be subjected to the material and the processes, for example. Mm -hmm. So even when I'm working on, you know, on, on, on different projects and exhibitions, I'm thinking very consciously of precisely how does the flatness is exploiting the, 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 the ideas of flatness, right? For example, mm -hmm. you know, the image that you see right now was very purposefully printed on a glossy surface, exploiting the plasticity mm -hmm. or the lack of that tactility, right? Some of this happened with my transition from India to the US as well, like sort of this, mm -hmm. this definitions of a personal space, a societal and a communal space, Right. On a, mm -hmm. on a very physical surface, it's very different, right? It's contrasting for anybody who's experienced India, the mass population, the overwhelming sensations of all aspects of physicality is so heightened. And, and so especially that vision that you drew of hanging out of a DTC bus versus, you know, the emptiness <laughs> that one finds around one in America. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Precisely. So I, I I think that that was that was very defining within the work, and I feel mm -hmm. I uh, I'm very conscious in 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 selecting the final output or the final production of the work that it needs to be definitely you know symbiotic and it needs to be collaborative with what one is trying to do as well, right? Mm -hmm. So like uh, I would say, for example, that when I had first moved to the U.S. This is right after my experiences with the paintings of India and Handmade in India, right? And mm -hmm. in Handmade in India, we were traveling across the country, uh, documenting craftsmen, traditional craftsmen, visiting the smallest of villages possible, identifying, you know, the, uh, the master craftsmen, documenting their craft, engaging with them about their histories and their identities. And I remember, for example, distinctly, there was one trip that we took for about an eight hours on the roof of a four by four Jeep with 11 goats with us being for, like, so there's, it's, it's so the, the, the tactility and mm. the, 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 the realism of the world is so in the face in India, mm. which is something that I immediately felt quite absent when I first moved to the U S and I think what right. exacerbated that also was, you know, on a very personal level, this this want to now hold on to some objects and some ideas which were dear. Like, for example, we are so familiar with, you know, we, we feel so in control over, over documenting and archiving our personal memories to photographs and letters, for example. And here, in, suddenly, right, this is pre-Skype, pre-Zoom, where most of my correspondence were happening now on virtual through Yahoo Messenger chat and MSN Messenger chat, for example. And then mm. even these ideas of how does one now archive one's personal journey, one personal memory, is where it started to shift into that plasticity of a pixel, for example. And mm. these works suddenly became, started to respond to that. So, right. Right. so thank you for bringing that. I would also say that as we, as we look through, through more works as well, I think it was very obvious when I was thinking about it, you know, from a personal level and then thinking from a societal, from a community and from a global perspective as well, is that we feel, for example, that we, we have such dependence on the new media and the technology without having absolute no control over it, right? This is the time mm -hmm. when, when there was conversations about who owns the data, like Facebook and Google, for example, or when the Google uh, uh, Cultural Institute was documenting these paintings on extremely high resolution for archival mm -hmm. purposes, but yeah. was still mediated through the plasticity of the screen. So these comparisons, the shifts of material, shifts of scale and experiences, right? On a on a on a on a rectangular screen of a computer, a monumental work looks exactly the same as a miniature does. So that mm. shift of scale is something I was also very consciously thinking about. This was also the time when, you know, Taliban was destroying the Bamiyan Buddhas, all the destruction and iconoclasm that was happening in the Middle East with ISIS. But those were not individual moments in the history. Our history entirely is embedded with such atrocities overall. Yeah. So how does then start one start to engage with objects which are no longer 
even possible to have experience physically through destruction, through loss, through iconoclasm, for example. Yeah, so let's explore some of those themes because, of course, that uh, brings us to some of the themes behind your current show, There Is No God in the Temple. Um, So this transition from print and digital media back to, if you like, materiality, you know, um, uh, your focus on drawings, painting, sculpture in various media, and and some of these subjects that you're drawn to um, in your current body of work from objects, antiquity, memory, destruction, um, tell us a little bit more about some of the themes, the broader themes that are uh, exciting you right now, which are re- leading to the current body of work. Sure. Um, and and perhaps Bamiyan and this image is a, is a, is a great trigger point. <laughs> yeah. Since most of us remember that moment of horror watching the Bamiyan Buddhas being destroyed. So t- talk yeah. a little bit more about this. Um. So I, I, I would just maybe expand on what I was saying earlier as well, is that, you know, while it started with a personal curiosity and a concern about what does it mean to now have a dependence on, on this new platform that we were mm-hmm. getting more used to, and we are, of course, more now than ever before, it echoed back and forth between sort of multiple conversations that, that I was happening. For example, if you think about you know, how Benjamin would talk about the loss of aura in a work that is mechanically reproduced, right? The mm-hmm. dilemma of the original and the authentic, for example, yeah. right? Um, if you think about these ideas of 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 uh, destruction, but the destruction mm-hmm. also often leads to uh, production of cultural institutions, right? right? An object which is transposed from a site into a museum collection while one is building the collection, it is it is only happening because of this sudden transposition, a violent even to some extent, the transposition that was happening as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, so move to Chicago, for example, and being so intimately you know connected to the Art Institute immediately made me think about these ideas of collection in itself, right? Yeah. Sort of these mm-hmm. influences of an individual's collection and how it either threatens the state, or for example, how does one then start to think about gen- generation of these multiculturalism uh, mm-hmm. conversations around the museum? Um, some of the other aspects that I was thinking about a lot, more particularly, is again, move to Chicago led me in collaboration with the Oriental Institute. You know, the mm-hmm. first call that was gone that was made to after the looting of the Baghdad Museum, for example, yeah. Yeah. where the works were purposefully destroyed and looted to alter the history of a certain mm-hmm. site. Mm-hmm. Right. But then again, that happened in Eritrea with the Ethiopian army destroying the steels. It mm-hmm. happened with Parthenon that had, you know, gone through several transitions over the centuries. In Delhi, like just the site of Qutub Minar was what comes repeatedly comes back to my work as well. So some of these aspects. So of essentially, Mother- the spolia of these sites and how yeah. they kind of then transfer, you know, their meanings essentially yeah. in yeah. in a disembodied way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you know, the image that you see right now was part of an exhibition uh, at Baghdadi Large called the Lost Museum that I had done with Arshia. I yeah. think she's on the call as well as well. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think one of the things that that I was looking at was was not only like not only examining the iconoclasm, the politics behind it, right? For example, mm-hmm. but yeah. to think about precisely of how a history is altered, like an mm. individuals and a cultural and a, and a and an entire civilization's country's uh, identities are altered altogether. So these aspects are things which started to get influenced very directly into my mm-hmm. work. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I started to think about collection itself as an act of play. Yeah. Right. That, that we're talking about the, the simultaneous construction and destruction that was happening, but also think about overall in general, this ideas of, of, of modern ruins, right? There is a romanticization of ruins that we have in our society. Mm-hmm. You know, there are these new technological 
satellite imagery and, and, and X-ray scans that we could do to learn about history better than even the history knew itself, for example. But how does that modernity and that, that urbanization, and if you combine it with the role of military and militia uh, and personal greed even, for example, has starts to impact the way we understand ourselves as a society. Hmm. Well, uh, perhaps this is a good moment to look at uh, there is no God. Um, is that, uh, what's the next slide? Sorry. Yeah, uh, that's okay. I just, uh, no, I had, for oh. example, uh, yeah. it might be helpful to maybe contextualize how I landed up with this exhibition, Madhu, if mm -hmm. that makes sense. Uh, um, Please go so, ahead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so within my studio practice, I would say that uh, I, I never feel that one project sort of ends and the other begins. There's a continuum that happens. Of once, course, yeah. You know, work influences the other. Hmm. And uh, 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 prior to, you know, as I was working on uh, the exhibition for Threshold, uh, there was an exhibition that I, had, that I had recently concluded at the at the Northern Illinois Museum called All mm -hmm. We Are Breaking Our Stones. Yeah. Which was, which was responding to uh, a statement that the head of the Taliban had made in 2001, Mullah Omar, while he was declaring his atten uh, you know, intent to destroy the Bamiyan Buddhas, a mm -hmm. task that, that he had said that must be implemented at all tasks. Uh, but I think what is fascinating to me, for example, is that, uh, that you know, Taliban, for example, had... had uh, had reversed his decision from two years ago, uh, where Mullah had first wanted it to be preserved because they saw an opportunity of, of ec economic revenue, right? Generating, mm. which would be hopefully helping them in their um, in their drought as well, right? That was happening, the famine that was happening. In the Alabama. famine, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, uh, I remember when I was sort of, you know, reading more and more about the, the the more than the, the the performative intent of of the Taliban, right? You know how dramatically they had captured the entire moment, for example, mm. uh, and why that shift happened within a two year period. Mm. Uh, and I I um, um, I remember uh, in a book called Mullah Omar in the museum where uh, Finbar Berry Flood uh, had mentioned the interaction between the mullah and the director, the then director of Med, uh, Philip de Montebello, in which mm. he had pleaded the Taliban to allow the Met to find a way to take the sculptures out of Afghanistan. I think you might remember that moment as well, which is often not very well known otherwise. And he had said that let us take it out in the context of an art museum as cultural objects, right? Of works of art which are which are not cult or religious imagery. And I think this was, for example, a pivotal moment in which. Uh, the Taliban declared that if the West is, you know, willing to consider them as 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 just mere objects, so all we are destroying are stones. The value, mm -hmm. the nature of an object, the engagement of an object changed completely from that mm. one moment of interaction. So, so, so this sort of, in a way, started to dictate how I was looking into making. So, what you're seeing, for example, right now in the back is. Uh, is a, it is, it's, it's sculptures made of handmade paper. Uh, so it's yeah. cotton and abaca. And they are stagged as stones of pitu. And anybody who's from India would know that game, for example, as well, which is, mm -hmm. which is again, symbolic of constant redistribution and assembly and construction and destruction that is happening at the same time as well. Mm -hmm. uh, another uh, project that I was working on was called that Ruined Place, which responded to Mir, Mir Takimi, a poet who was contemporary of Ghalib in Delhi. Mm -hmm. uh, and when he was forced to move to Lucknow during the fall of the Mughal patronage mm -hmm. and uh, responding to the hostility and the lack of welcome in Lucknow, he had stated his reasons of leaving Delhi. And I'll quote him here. He said, uh, Delhi, that was once a select city in the world where only chosen lived of every trade. Then the heavens looted and left it desolate. I'm a citizen of that human place. So that sort of pathos, that that understanding of a decline, right? Again, which in a way, a cultural, uh, 
downfall is very much akin to the object iconoclasm as well. Right? In that sense, for example, uh, very much echoed with the work. I was thinking also, uh, for example, uh, a 2003 report that was presented to the Parliament of India by the Comptroller General, where mm. they had discovered that 92 monuments had had uh, become untraceable, is what they had called it. Like this is a this is a society which was yeah. not. Yeah, this war. is. Yeah, I mean, the the, the this thing seems to. Um... Uh, you know, we constantly seem to be losing our monuments, but and and it, it's so frightening when the ASI isn't able to report about what's happening to the sites. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so you feel that these were kind of leading to some of the present yeah. body of work. Very mm -hmm. much so. I think that's the moment. You know, from the from the point of Bamiyan, for example, or from that report. For me, it changed the lens a little bit from thinking about objects specifically, but mm -hmm. thinking about the lack of objects rather, right? The, the disappearance, the ghost of that, that, mm -hmm. that remains. Mm -hmm. uh, in this example, uh, you know, this was installed at Sundaram in New York, yeah. where, uh, where I was taking the tradition of Mannat, right, that we are very familiar with in temples and, and Sufi shrines, for example, where the architecture has now disappeared, leaving just this faint, oily ghost on the surface. Mm -hmm. And even the threads have disappeared, mm -hmm. right? Have gone away. But what was accumulated as dust and oil was converted into this porcelain. Mm -hmm. So uh, this shift of material and this shift of, of, of thinking about an object while being physically, visually present in an exhibition but simultaneously talks about the lack of which of, of, of the tactility, the ghost that, that remains, but a tactile ghost to some extent, is what led to you know, this exhibition. Um, so the 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 idea of there is no God in the temple comes from you know Tagore's poem from 1900. Mm -hmm. uh, he writes about a moment of a rich patron. Um, actually, before you go into that, let's translate for people uh, what uh, you have written in Bengali uh, because uh, let's let, let's translate that uh, what you're seeing on the wall is the translation of Tagore's original words which is oi mondi re um, kono debota ne um, which translates to there is no god in the temple so go on um, Shara t tell us a bit more about um, uh, Tagore's words and the context in which he um, wrote these words. Thank you, Madhu, for translating. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's wonderful to see also, right, that engagement of when the words is familiar to somebody who's who can speak and read Bengali versus for somebody who's becomes, uh, you know, a form of an aesthetic than a language. Mm -hmm. I think that's yeah. always very very interesting as well. So yeah, so in Tagore's poem. Uh, you know, he sort of writes about a moment when a rich patron, a king, invites a hermit to a newly constructed temple. Uh, and the saint in turn refuses to even enter the threshold of the complex, marking that even the, even the temple that is glittered in gold and touches the sky remains devoid of the divine itself. For me, for example, this was parallel also to, you know, what was happening you know, in the recent past, particularly uh, with, you know, the, the arrest of Subhash Kapoor and, and, and this acknowledgement that between 2008 and 2012, there were about 2200 sculpture that were that were stolen from living temples, right, mm -hmm. where these centuries old temples and idols uh, were suddenly, uh, again, like fragmented and, and the temples the architecture became complete ruin, even if yeah. it condition existed fine, right? But yeah. uh, but that shift again that happens with a simple act of transposition of mm -hmm. an object and ghost of a memory that was now existing and the materiality had removed is mm -hmm. something that I started to think more about as well. So in this case, uh, you know, the text is written, is processed similarly, as I was mentioning before, like it with took, your Mannat work. Yeah. With my Mannat work. It mm -hmm. took me, I would say, roughly about two and a half, three years of of 
of deep experimentation with the porcelain as a material you know porcelain you is share a... with us some of the process um yeah. uh yeah. show us uh, some of the detail of that uh, yeah. it will be like, interesting, just, I think. uh so you can see the yeah. detail here mm -hmm. and this is not what a porcelain is supposed to otherwise do right and mm -hmm. and tunti can tell you uh how delicate the work is it's hollow completely it's thinner uh -huh. than an eggshell uh -huh. uh, but to be able to retain the quality of the texture, the tension of every single knot that was made mm -hmm. uh, was something that I was deeply concerned with as a process, as a material. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, unlike what would happen in a, in a temple otherwise, where Nandi would be looking at the shivling, for example, here she is looking at the ghost of a text which mm -hmm. declares that there is no God in that temple. So mm -hmm. they go sort of together. And what it does is that just like the way in Garbhagraha or in Sanctum Sanctorum, that space is activated between the devotee and, and, and the divine, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but the, so the space is existing. It's still activated equally, but now to, to no end because there is no divinity now left there. And it's been very clearly declared as well at the same time. So this work, uh, the, this uh, quote is, of course, taken from Dino Dan, and you do have a work. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, so just another, again, I hope you can see just yeah, the way the porcelain is mm -hmm. working, um, mm -hmm. uh, which is, so the entire poem in its, in, its, uh, in its full length is in the suite of 18 drawings that you see in the back. Wow. Um, and I have a detail of how the text appears also. Mm -hmm. uh, so these are all done um, on five inches by four inch gold leaf rectangles. On and this is with soot, right? With soot, yeah. So yeah. the mm -hmm. text was burned into the gold. Mm -hmm. Like, again, uh, just thinking about that contrast between, you know, that conversation between the hermit and the king, the glitter mm -hmm. of the gold versus... Mm -hmm the graphicness of the black soot that comes, you know, you with it, for example, mm -hmm. uh, each one of them, you know, so I think maybe this is where my print comes in as well, while these are not right. multiple, these are drawings really, mm -hmm. but they mm -hmm. are done in the method of a matrix with stencils and, and controlled in a way that one would, would, you know, want to achieve in a print also, for example. So this body of work is shown in juxtaposition with that ruined place. Do you want to show, uh, tell us a little bit about that work as well while we're yeah, at the... uh, Let me, uh, so this is, so there are, uh, the one on the left is a work that I had done uh, uh, two or three years ago. And the one mm -hmm. in the exhibition is the one on the right, mm -hmm. which is uh, the text, you know, which is, uh, uh, the Persian uh, coming out of the East Gate on Kutub Minar, where oh. the declaration was made, where it stated that, uh, uh, I'm, I'm not translating it directly, but it said basically declaring the coming of Islam at the mm -hmm. site of Lal Port, where 26 Hindu and Jain temples had once stood, for example. Right, 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 right. Uh, so again, like thinking about the contrast between you know, what is celebrated by one is coming at the cost of the destruction of the other, for example, mm -hmm. as well. And but for me, for example, sorry, the, yeah. the, soot, the, the idea of the soot yeah. echoed with me very much. Well, it's a, it's a, probably it's a terrible example, but this black graphic photographs, right, after the bomb in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, where, where people had evaporated, but mm. the, the subtle the temperature shift between the shadow and a non-shadow area where the shadows got permanently etched to the ground. Again, it's like, mm. like haunting imagery of the ghost of a memory of one existing living person, right? Kind which, of evaporating, yeah. Mm -hmm. Which, you know, in, in Hinduism, that is that is not any different than how an idol is treated, right? An idol is considered to be alive. They sleep in the night. They are woken in the morning. They're given showers. They are dressed according to the weather. So there is a celebration that happens among, among the living of the divinity. And then, then that compounds with the lack of that, the loss of that, 
Vishwami echoed again back with just the material of the graphicness of that suit as well. Um, before we move on from this, I, I would like you to show people your Siddhi side, you know, the 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 bigger work that you've done with Soot because yeah. it is such an incredible yeah. work. Um, yeah. yeah, maybe share this a little bit as well before we sure. move on. Uh, so Madhu Siddhi side, I don't know if I I I. I included the image. Uh, oh, okay. That's, but uh, show that's this a, one. Show, this show one, the Sikhi yeah. image. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The city side is, you know, 60 feet by 12 feet <laughs> on, a, on a drywall. So it's. But massive. explain how it's done because I think that's what uh, I, I really wanted you to focus on because some of the yeah. detail of this type of work uh, it yeah. is really like mind boggling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. No, so I feel that, you know, as you were asking the question earlier about the materiality. Right, yeah. the calculation of 2D and 3D. I think this is again an example of, of maybe exploiting one's uh, one's uh, uh, familiarity with the ideas of drywall and gypsum board, right? Mm. And what is used and uh, is often is a direct relation to to constructing a safe yeah. place, homes, right? Like whatever, and it still continues to be quite delicate as well. Mm. And, um, you know, as for example, you know, again, I'll quote that, uh, that study that was presented to the Parliament of India, where the ruins, which were often, right, carved out of stone, marbles and sandstones and whatever, had suddenly disappeared. So even something which was considered permanent mm. had a fragility obvious within that. So in this case, it sort of reverses it that that now the gypsum board is now becoming more permanent, but still defaced by that soot. And the monuments, which were not appearing in physical, hmm. were now appearing as ghost, as just black and white. As shadows, almost. As well as yeah. Shadows, mm -hmm. yeah, 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 yeah. Um, it's really fascinating to see how your work uh, with this kind of, um, you know, this body of work has kind of evolved with the gold leaf as well. I mean, it's it's like seeing it kind of in another, um, it's taken another form. Um, perhaps we should move on to the last of the body of works uh, associated yeah. with gold leaf, if in yeah. a sacred land, a traveler. Yeah. yeah. Can you talk yeah. briefly about this before we move on to the paintings? Sure. I'm just yeah. conscious uh, of the time. So, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, I didn't keep a track of the time. Yeah. Sorry. So, I think this one, um, you know, the, all these works were happening parallel. The yeah. Siddhi side I'm talking about, or uh, the Sikri that I showed you, for example. Mm -hmm. So, I sort of often, um, you know, as a pendulum, go back and forth between working on many different works at the same time. Mm -hmm. Some of them monumental and physical in scale, some of them much more delicate. But this one, it really, in a way, started uh, with just thinking about, you know, the tradition of gold leaf uh, or, or thinking about the, the ideas of sacredness, the mm. abstract ideas of sacredness, the expansive ideas of sacredness, uh, where, again, similarly to way in Tagore's poem, the king thought of his temple being a sacred site, whereas a hermit thought it was devout of the, of the divine in itself. Uh, there was a moment in which uh, I was leading a study trip uh, to to uh, uh, to Sarnath with mm -hmm. students, uh, and uh, there was a group of monks, I believe, from Thailand, who had attempted to put a small one inch by one inch gold leaf on the stupa, and were suddenly pro you know prohibited by the prohibited. guard, prohibited, yeah, right, and pointing to the big sign saying, "Do not put gold leaf on the side." The the sign was prohibiting was way larger than the gold leaf which was one inch by one inch right and i was thinking about this the site being sacred but at the same time that sacredness being removed. not allowing the sacredness to be manifest on the stupa precisely, yeah. mm -hmm. precisely. Mm -hmm. uh, so i was thinking about that 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 tradition that material that engagement right mm -hmm. similarly to the way we think about the ideas of darshan in a temple also yeah. um uh, it appeared in Manath, for example. It appeared in these cases as well. Mm -hmm. So I, I put the gold leaf within a rectangle of a paper and started to do drawings by scratching away the gold leaf. So again, mm -hmm. similarly echoing the ideas to destroy something as a pristine surface to now construct something as well. 
Mm-hmm. And the, the title of this body of work, if in a sacred land of traveler, is keeping that idea very abstract. Like how would one engage with the with a sacred site when a traveler does visit? Uh, but it's but also it, the graffiti that the travelers leave behind, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. Absolutely, mm-hmm. absolutely. So yeah. I, that precisely, precisely. Yeah. So I yeah. was thinking about it in in the absolute romantic terms of what a destruction it's like is. byron leaving his little uh, etching on his, yeah. his autograph yeah. yeah somewhere yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah precisely yeah, yeah. so these mm-hmm. are the these are the drawings that came out of that series yeah. yeah it's beautiful it's a gorgeous series um i'm going to rush us on um to yeah. uh, a body of work that you're showing here uh, which are these paintings because they they also have a resonance with the art institute um, yeah. So uh, I, I remember being very taken by this particular painting because, of course, uh, the original of this work uh, that inspired you is at the Art Institute. Um, the thing that, of course, interests me is the fact that you have this blank uh, red space where Krishna would have been. Um, in uh, the Pichwai tradition, Krishna's absence is actually a way of talking about viraha, longing for Krishna. But tell us a little bit about this body of work of yours and how you think about absence. Yeah. uh, So, you know, you were earlier asking about the impact of SAIC or moving to Chicago, for example, or or the presence here, I think, was was starting to really... um, manifest itself very, very obviously in these cases. Uh, in fact, you know, thanks to you, I saw this exhibition, this work in the exhibition, The Gates of the Lord that you had curated on the Pichuai as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think similarly to the way I was talking about, you know, earlier that um, I was thinking about a lot in terms of the impact of such lootings, for example, or the smuggling of artifacts, the, the, the temples left in the ruins uh, and the impact on the community. Right. Yeah. So, for example, you know, now that the temples have been left empty, the shrines have been left empty, even during the, the process of repatriation, where many of the objects are coming back, they are never going back to the shrine. They are never going back to the people. So the people continue to incur that loss mm-hmm. uh, without without any end. So does their visit to the temple conclude still their ideas of sacredness and divinity? I don't, mm-hmm. That's a question that one has to ask, right? But we always do talk about these ideas through political and economic standpoint, but never from the community perspective. Mm. So here it is, you know, one could think of it as a longing, but the one could think of it as a completely redundant act of Yashoda chasing with a stick, but to a rectangular square, mm-hmm. right? So I think that kind of, a, uh, there's a humor to that. Right. For example, there is a uh, there is an irony to that. There is a there's a fabricated fakeness to that as well. There's a dramatization of Yashodara standing as a still hmm. nothing at all, for example. Or here you see women worshipping an empty pedestal hmm. where otherwise the shivling originally was, for example. Hmm. Or you see Radha and Krishna are no longer there, but their reflection in the mirror, which again echoes the ideas of a, of a memory, right, starting to sort of become very obvious and triggering in that also at the same time. Hmm. And then I have, I think, one last image of another painting where, you know, the lack of Lakshman and Ram now suddenly exaggerate the presence of landscape. So it changes the way you now start to understand and interact with that one. And mm-hmm. I feel it's also quite interesting that if you were to see this painting for an example, and it says an illustration from Ramayan, Ram and Lakshman, it's in the title, but completely absent from an imagery. So do the trees now start to represent the divinity themselves, for example, or you know a replacing of a fabricated uh, reproduction of an mm-hmm. idol from a stolen temple would now suffice the absence of an idol. So that sort of kind of fabrication, that kind of a fakeness, that kind of an interaction is sort of part of those paintings. Well, it's interesting to me also that um, in this body of work, you've gone back to that 
big body of work that you did with uh, Benoit, you know, on the paintings yeah. of India. So I think uh, one sees echoes of that here. Um, let's go on to the final uh, couple of works, which is Broken Hands. And um, um, this, this, of course, is stunning, uh, a case of broken hands. Uh, we're all familiar with um, uh, body parts in all of our institutions. But tell us how you think about this this um, yeah uh, particular work thank you so uh, again i would refer to uh, uh, you know a black and white photograph that was from i believe 1931 1932 from the archives of the national museum it was a black and white photograph from the basement of the national museum in delhi with mm -hmm. these very fragments and it was titled the case of broken hands so at the case itself being a pun, for example, right? These are these are these are fragments without bodies, mm -hmm. and there is also no no way to track them back as well. So mm -hmm. in, I was thinking about the ideas of collection uh, that the collection doesn't always displays attention to the past, but rather past is often as a service to the collection, right? Mm -hmm. Where a souvenir lends the authenticity to the past and the past lends this authenticity to the collection. So that mm -hmm. again, paradox and the dichotomy was part of this, this thought process. Uh, I think about this you know, collection in itself, but responding again to the collections that we see at the museum as a form of play, right? Mm -hmm. So I think this ideas of, of humor, playfulness, what was happening in the paintings, for example, is becoming very obvious in this one as well. Uh, these are all uh, sculpted on the computer because these are these are the objects which nobody knows where they are now. So these are all sculpted from references of black and white photographs from the National Museum's archive. Mm -hmm. uh, but they are presented. I think these would have been ASI um, photographs from archaeological um, um, excavations because yeah. they yeah. are the ones who would have uh, put such photographs together yeah yeah mm -hmm. yeah 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 yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, so for me you know these become and i'll move to the next one madhu for the sake of time as well yes mm -hmm. uh, become sort of these ideas of 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 uh, you know almost like plastic souvenirs that one starts to collect and identify you know in in museums for example mm -hmm. uh, I remember in one of the interviews uh, i believe sudha uh, from rux had said like Delhi is an emporium of dreams that sell at a discount, right? Okay. So sort of that that ideas of devaluing something, the souvenir, yeah, the souvenir, right? For mm. example, or mm. that the fact that the object suddenly has no value when it is sitting in a temple site being worshipped by thousands of people over centuries has now suddenly a value, a shift of materiality that we were talking about only when it goes to a collector and a collection. Mm -hmm. So, and Preferably again, abroad, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mostly abroad, of course. So mm -hmm. again, a non-object becoming an object, a, 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 an object of no value or a collective emotional value has suddenly has a monetary value to that, for example. No, and an object of desire becomes suddenly yeah, transformed exactly. into an object of desire. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this one was actually directly in response to, uh, uh, you know, the act of repatriation that started during Obama's time when he was the mm -hmm. president, mm -hmm. uh, where four different countries, after it was identified that they were proven stolen between 2008 and 2012, mm -hmm. that they had promised these objects to be repatriated back to India. So yeah. uh, I had, again, like thinking about this act of play as an idea of collection, had made the Chaucer, which, you know, has a connotation of cheat and deceit, the change mm -hmm. of hands. Uh, so each quadrant of the Chaucer by color represents four different countries. So right, there's the US, there's Australia, there's Germany mm -hmm. and Singapore who had mm -hmm. promised repatriation. And uh, there is a set of dice, uh, mm -hmm. which, you know, for example, would symbolize a person with power. The person who holds the dice has a power and then randomly changes the fate of an object as well. So sometimes it becomes mine, sometimes it becomes yours, sometimes it goes missing, for an example. Mm -hmm. So that randomness of fate, that fabrication of, you know, for example, what Subhash Kapoor would do, uh, 
I should I, I should have included an image of that one, but there was an article in New York Times which which made such a satire of the whole process in which they declared eleven different steps to steal saint out of India, like step by step of precisely what you could do to do that. One of it was, of course, to fabricate, uh, you know, through making the molds, fabricate duplicates as again multiples as talking from the point of printmaking, for example, and. Mm. Uh, in Subhash Kapoor's case, for example, he would get a certificate of authenticity, uh, oh, uh, sorry, uh, a certificate of handicraft, but ship the original, make a completely, you know, fake documented provenance and then sell it to various collections. So this sort of, this change of, this change, just manipulation, uh, the fate of the object through manipulation and cheat is something which became part of, of this work as well. Yeah, this is a very thought-provoking work. Um, yeah. So I that's, that's the last slide I had. I don't know yeah. Um, so um, I'm sorry we've gone on a little bit longer than I had anticipated. Um, thank you, Sharia. That was a wonderful, um, uh, you know, uh, journey through this. Your own personal journey, coupled with the journey of um, this particular show that's on a threshold. Um, Atunji, do we have any questions or um, uh, are there any I'm questions that anyone should... yeah. I'm gonna stop screen sharing so we can see everybody if that's- Of course, that's yeah. Thank you. Maybe we can open the floor for direct questions if anybody would like to question uh, Shorya, but we are short on time, so we're probably taking just one or two. Okay, uh, if anyone has a pressing question, please, uh, Feel free to ask us right now. Yeah. Hi, Catherine. I see you there. Lovely to see you. You're mute, I think. I don't know if you're saying something. I, said, I love, I just love hearing you explain everything. The work is so beautiful. I get carried away. Uh, the quality of that. I hear you untangle all of the uh, riddles and connections. Um, I think it's, it's wonderful. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, is someone asking us a question? Yeah, please well, go ahead. Uh, uh, Shaurya, my name is Damesh. Do you hear me? Yes, we Hi, do. Yes. Please go I ahead. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, my name is V. Damesh. I also show it to T. And uh, it's been nice this, having a listen to this dialogue between both of you because. Uh, certain aspects of what Shoya was talking are also my concerns. Precisely when it comes to devotion, when it comes to sacredness. But we seem to be approaching uh, the whole issue from totally opposite ends of the whole thing. Um, maybe sometime later, when Shoya is back in India and Kunti has the time and inclination, we perhaps can have a dialogue or a discussion on how do you approach the idea of sacredness? Um, can it be a very dispassionate uh, sociological aspect or can one be part of it? Can one be part of a, a devotee or a poet who actually made those statues or who wrote that poetry or who were part of it. I mean, sure, this is just, it's not a question, but wondering out aloud. Well, I think no. that will make a very good uh, and interesting dialogue <laughs> yeah. uh, for a future event, Tunti. Note that. Yes. I have an idea there. <laughs> right there before me and we should definitely take this up. Thank you, Lani. I was just yeah, going to go say, Ramesh, I, I, I know and I admire your work so much as well. I have one question because what, what we share in common is our connection between Chicago and New Delhi. Oh, wow. I'm a Chicago <laughs> native, spent, grew up at the Art Institute of Chicago practically. And it's also um, because I grew up in this huge uh, pervasive Catholicism that's so evident in Chicago with all those ma the massive cathedrals and all the different ethnic groups. Yeah. Um, and for me, I so I connected so strongly to everything you're discussing in Hinduism because of growing up Catholic. There are so many similarities to that. And I was just because you also lived in the in the West, which must have been really geographically totally different from Delhi before you came to Chicago. 
I'm just curious about how you've interacted with the different kind of cultural aspects and uh, and possibly religions of Chicago and the way that you've connected with Hinduism. Because for me, there was such a strong sense of familiarity and, and connection in India because of growing up in Chicago. Yeah. No, thank you for that question. And I feel I feel that particularly in that you know, the gold leaf drawing uh, body of work. One thing that I didn't mention is that all the imagery that you see ranges from it being representational to be very abstract. And all the drawings that were made were made purely from the memory of, of various sites that I have visited personally that I would consider sacred for myself, irrespective of the religion. Right? So there's a number of them from Islamic sites, some from from. From, uh, from from churches as well, from Buddhist sites, from Hindu sites, from Jain sites as well. But I think the range of that varies so much that I was thinking of, of thinking about that inclusively of precisely what that sacredness might be. Uh, I also feel that, you know, in the Chaucer piece, for example, or even in the case of Broken Hands, it was ir it was irrespective of it being specific to one site or one context or one narrative or one reference as well. So I thank you for that. I think maybe I need to do more consciously, but I I think of it as a as a very larger holistic and a very larger idea of you know as I said of 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 thinking about the community, thinking about how they start to understand and how that starts to manifest within their sacredness. So, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I think, I think we've run out of time and I'd like to thank all of you who joined us. Thank you so much again, Madhu, for taking our time and making an exception and having this conversation with Shorya. I'd just like to end by saying that the exhibition is on till the 15th of February. It is a parallel event to the India Art Fair. We've also printed some catalogs. So in case anybody would you know, want one, please do send in a request. We'll mail you a copy. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. 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 Bye.